Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't make any sense because the entire OG is like golden hair. Golden hair. Golden hair. <laughs> 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 excited to have Wolf's Voices number 34 uh, here tonight with amazing uh, readers lined up and sponsored by the Alexandra Writer Society. Just a tiny bit of housekeeping, we have books for sale at the front um, and some zines and such, so go take a look. Uh, washrooms are through the door to your right and there are candies and coffee in the back corner. We got candies back there, so go check that out. I'm going to introduce our host and fearless organizer, Adrian Adams, and then hand things over. Adrian Adams, artist, poet, writer, curator, herb nerd, and gardener, living and breathing in Treaty 7, dedicated to creating safer intersectional space to honor the feminine. She founded Wolf's Voices in 2013. Her publications include Filling Station, Horizons, and Antelang. Uh, Free Fall, New Forum, Node, Death Cap, Coven Editions, The Mother Othering um, from Anana Press, Polyglot, YYC Pop, and her chat book, Redheads, uh, by Above Slash Ground Press. Thank you, Shopfly, for hosting us for so many years. And um, let's also give a big howl to our sponsor uh, at the Alexander Writers Center. Oh! Fabulous. And I'm going to introduce um, Cheryl Chagnon Grey Eyes, um, who will do a land acknowledgement for us before she performs. And um, I've known Cheryl for many years and seen her speak and perform, and she has such great heart that I'm really, really looking forward to it. So um, Cheryl Chagnon Grey Eyes is a member of the Muskeg Lake Cree Nation. Her Cree name translates to healing woman who walks far. Cheryl is an activist, marching, singing, and drumming for MMIW G2S, Missing and Murdered Women, Indigenous Justice, Environment and Climate Change, and speaking up for those who cannot. Former leader of the Green Party of Alberta, she retired from the University of Calgary Native Center and is busy in Calgary and area sharing Indigenous teachings, traditional cultural openings, and sharings, acting, singing, drumming, providing service to women's shelters, including Awatan Healing Lodge, Radiance Family Services, and the YW Calgary. And I recently saw her um, perform in a rendition of the vagina logs and she made me cry <laughs> and then she made me laugh <laughs> so uh, please welcome uh cheryl chagnon and Bonjour. Bonjour. How's it going? Eh? <laughs> I 
I always like ending in Canadian. <laughs> um, as you saw, Adrian gifted me with tobacco. In the indigenous tradition, when you give tobacco to a knowledge keeper, an elder, um, a healer, a medicine person, it is from your heart to my heart to creator. And it creates a sacred covenant, a blessed promise. It shows that you come with good intent in your heart and that your heart is filled with respect, gratitude, and appreciation. And because it is a sacred covenant, this little guy lasts longer than a mortgage. And the mortgages are getting longer, right? <laughs> Um, I am from Treaty 6, Muskeg Lake Cree Nation. My uh, Cree name is Nanantawe Esquayo Yohoka Pimote. Aren't you glad I didn't have to say that? <laughs> <laughs> I am very blessed and very honored to be able to share with you today. Um, I want to share a little traditional territorial acknowledgement that came from Creator to me. It was an inspiration I received in the middle of the night. And uh, it's in this e-zine called the Riverfest YYC. And uh, we're selling those e-zines up at the front there. They're $10 a piece. And my piece that I'm going to be sharing with you is in this. And literally, um, I was jolted out of bed about 4 o'clock in the morning, raced at the computer and jotted this down. So this is a little different from some of the other traditional ter uh, territorial acknowledgements that you will hear. And I invite you to close your eyes. And I'm going to take you on a little trip to the past, the present, and the future. We are visitors to this land, the lands of the Treaty 7 people, the lands before. This place we call Calgary, Mokinstis. The meeting of the Bow and the Elbow Rivers, the joining of the waters, firmament and fluid left behind by ancient glaciers, melting waters, land rising, dripping, drying into dust and dirt. The six Aitsitapi, the original peoples of these prairies, foothills and mountains. They are the Blackfoot of Siksika, Gaina, and Bagani, the Blackfoot Confederacy. They have been sustained by the Ini, the buffalo, the bison, nomads walking, walking in the footsteps of their ancestors. The Dene of Tutsina, the Sarsi peoples from far north, stretching south across Turtle Island, separating, following the land and the waters, walking, trekking, heading north, heading south, always forward, always onward. The Stony people, Aarhe Nakoda, horses and hooves, hunting and hiking, seeking, seeking and searching for that life-giving living food and the provisions for their families. Chiniki, Beresba, good Stony nation. And the proud and hardworking Métis, newer to this land yet, still connected to their relatives, their ancestors, to those who have come before. Following, following the bison, the sustenance of the peoples, footprints in the blackened earth, footfalls forming paths through grasses and forests, climbing hills and mountains, forward, onward, connected to land and spirit always, ancestors and future kin, those who have been on this land for millennia, living, dying, fighting, thriving, sharing, close to land and spirit always, to walk in their ancient footsteps, Footfalls, now paths and sidewalks. Hooved earth, now roadways. Roots linked to those ancient roots of family, of blood, of remembering, 
a spiritual connection to those who have come before. We are visitors to this land. We must walk these lands with respect and humility, gratitude and appreciation, in recognition of those who have come before and who are still here today, the lands of the Treaty 7 people. Thank you, Creator, for blessings received. Hi, hi. I wish to open this in a, in a good way, and that's with song. This is known as the um, the welcome song, the Cree song. Say after me, Mia Sin. Miasen. 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 Miasen means beautiful. And I welcome your beautiful spirits that you've brought here to share today. And I invite spirit to join us on this journey of learning, of sharing, of hearing words, hearing songs, feeling hearts, understanding minds, sharing this space with our bodies in a good way and welcoming the spirit in a good way. Mia Sin was written by Joseph Nato Howe and his sister Violet, who hail from Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation, Treaty 6. Probably a cousin, we tend to be related in Saskatchewan. <laughs> <laughs> Normally when I sing my songs, I sing them in rounds of four to honor the teachings of the medicine wheel, but this one's a little different. And I sing it with purpose and intent in three rounds to keep it open and inclusive and welcoming each and every one of you and your beautiful spirit that you have brought here to share today. This is Mia Sin, the Cree welcome song. Mia Sin, Mia Sin. Asamina Asamina Epe the Gode Iwaguma Oh, oh Manitoba. 
and uh, she was very much white and on that side of the river most of the people were Caucasian colonialists people who had come to settle this land and work the land and and uh, make a living and raise their families here on the other side of the river was a Pascua Cree nation and there was a divide bigger than that river and it was a divide between two peoples who could not understand each other in this book she documents what she went through growing up and what her experience was like and how she was inspired by the indigenous people when she got a chance to visit with them when they came over to trade or to use the stores and the services that the Pa had to share. She also shared she was so inspired she wanted to save the world and she became a social worker and wanted to work especially with the indigenous peoples. But she was missing some information. And her job as a social worker had her going across the river to apprehend children to work with the RCMP to make sure these children went to residential school and their parents didn't object because they could be thrown into jail. She didn't know that this was a bad thing. She really believed she thought she was doing better for this population, this impoverished population. And later on, when she was a social worker, she started, they started taking the kids through the 60s school. Same thing. She thought she was doing good work by having other people raise these kids whose parents had fallen into addiction, depression, violence, abuse. But you live long enough, you learn long enough. And she did. And the reason I brought this is because I mentioned in here and I was part of my friend's journey to learn the true nature of Indigenous peoples, to learn and understand what ceremony was, to understand the teachings of the medicine wheel that all needs to be in balance. And uh, not to give anything away, but she's a really staunch ally now. I'm really proud. <laughs> and I'm blessed to have been asked to share in this book with her. And um, I brought copies here. And Shelf Life Book has agreed to sell them on our behalf. And my timing was good because when I went up to Emma and I said, Oh, I got this book. Do you think? Crossing the river, somebody called looking for that yesterday. Yes. <laughs> yes. So she's got eight copies there to sell if you want to buy them. Get them while they're hot. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that I do do is I do a Jane's Walk every year up on Nose Hill. I've been doing it to 2015, before the Blackfoot Confederacy Medicine Wheel was up on that hill. And I've been asked by my friend Julie at the Calgary Foundation, Cheryl, we need an Indigenous walk. We don't have an Indigenous walk. Can you do, give us an Indigenous walk? So I prayed over it, and I'm looking at maps of Nose Hill, and I kept being drawn to the east side where the teepee rings were. And I thought, well, I'm going to go check this out. So I parked the parking lot, not the one at 64th Avenue, the one in between on the east side, between just behind the Calgary Winter Club. And uh, here, lo and behold, there's an old road going up this hill. And you know it's a road because it's asphalt. And you know it's old because it's got trees growing out of it. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'm going to trace up this old road. So I trace up the old road. And, and I look south to where the city skyline and it was beautiful. And the field was covered in crocuses. For me, that's creator's check mark. You know, you're on the right path when. Mm -hmm. So that's where I had my first circle the following week right there in that place. A year later, I'd heard about and seen drone footage of the medicine wheel, but I didn't really know where it was. So my friend and I are traipsing up the hill with, we had 20 people the first year, 30 people the second year. 
traipsing up that hill, we go over the little hill, over the big hill, in the exact same place where I had held my circle the year before, that's where they put the Blackfoot Confederacy Medicine Wheel. Mm -hmm. The Blackfoot elders had come together from all of the four nations of the Blackfoot Confederacy. And that those four nations are Siksika, Gaina, Begani North, which is in Canada, and Begani South, which is in the United States, Montana, where the Blackfoot people are called the Blackfeet. I don't know why. That's just, they just are. And that's where Lily Gladstone is from Killer, Flowers of the Killer Moon. Yes. She spoke Blackfoot, by the way, when she was accepting her Golden Globe. And uh, so I wasn't quite ready for this prize. There's this Confederacy whale. So the next year, I talked to my Blackfoot elders. I knew what to do. We were ready. I had about 40 people that time. And uh, we traipsed up that hill. And I always bring my daughter's drums, Chantal, notorious drum maker that she is. And for some people, it's the first time they've ever felt and held a drum. And it, it feels so good. It's that connection. We all have that connection to our first heartbeat, right? Inside our mother's womb. And that's our first drum beat. And so up at the top of the hill, I taught them how about the medicine wheel and what it signified and the nations that it represented. And I brought a bag of tobacco for offering. So I invited all the people that were there. I said, you're welcome to line up on the east side of the circle of the medicine wheel and take a pinch of tobacco and go to the center, face north, as we believe that's where creator is. Hold your tobacco up high. Thank you, Creator, for blessings received. You're asking for permission, giving thanks with that, holding that tobacco. And then taking that sacred tobacco and sprinkling it on the very center of that circle on Mother Earth. Thank you, Mother Earth, for the gifts of your bounty. And tobacco is a natural fertilizer, so it does good things on that hill. So, and then after they're done their prayer, I always encourage them to pray out loud. Because when you pray out loud, you add frequency and vibration to your words, your thoughts, your prayers. And so I encourage them to pray out loud. And also, your ancestors love you. They want to hear from you. If you're having issues and you want help, ask for help. You don't ask, you don't get, okay? <laughs> so ask for help, and they want to help you. So pray out loud, ask them. Just remember that, and I tell this to my grandson all the time. He goes, yeah, Kirkland, I know. No is an answer to, <laughs> and no is an answer to. And sometimes that's even a So this year, the first Sunday in May, I go up there at noon. I ask, if you'd like to come, you're welcome to register. It's, there's no charge. You register on the James Walk website. And this year is a little bit different because May 5th is Red Dress Day. For those who aren't familiar with red dress, the red dress art installation was um, first inspired and made by Jenny Black, a Winnipeg artist. And she had lost family, as many Indigenous people, including myself, have lost family to the missing and murdered Indigenous women, Indigenous girls, Indigenous two spirit, pandemic. That's an, that's an epidemic right there, and it's still happening. Um, five years ago, my cousin on my reserve, her name was Deanna Gray Eyes. When we were kids, we used to ride bareback. She didn't need no stick and saddles. We rode barebacks. We used to ride bareback all the time. My mom would let us be there for the summer. We were at the farm with the reserve. We were seeing grandma and grandpa cook them in motion. And all my cousins were right there, so we got to enjoy the time with my cousins. And um, she was found stabbed to death yards from her home on Muskeg. And her car was gone. Um, this is one of the few that actually resulted in a conviction. It took four years for the perpetrator to be found. I figured they had the car 
So we're talking, you know, DNA and fingerprints. I watch CSI. I know what that is. <laughs> so why aren't they doing anything? So it ended up being one of her nephews who was high on meth and wanted her car to go and get some more drugs, saying it had Prince Albert, and that's where they found the car. So there isn't a family that's not protected. <coughs> and uh, I want to share the women's honoring song in a good way to honor the strength and the power of the feminine. This song was written by jo uh, Joan Henry, who is Arapaho Cherokee. And uh, I love this song because it really does honor the strength of the woman. I have a dear friend of mine who's in the foothills. She's been in there now for a year. She went in with COVID. Yeah, she was on a ventilator for a month. She's never woken up. But I visit her once or twice a month and I sing four songs for her. And I rattle, play the rattle. And the last two times she had her eyes open. And I really think she was there with me. And this is one song that I sing to honor her. This song is also known as Anagaya, the woman's honoring song. Clement. It's very powerful and moving. Thank you so much. Um, and I highly encourage you to buy both of those books. Cheryl Gifted Me the Zine. It's beautiful. One of the most beautiful land acknowledgments I've ever read. And I, uh, I went to the launch of Crossing the River and it was also very, very moving. So I highly encourage you to buy that book as well. And we could put them up here. Um, there's a few uh, 
of books for people. And also, there's quite a few people at the back that are standing. And we have seats up here. So there's like two seats up here, which are really accessible if you come in that way. Uh, or the other corner, you can come in. Um, please come have a seat. There's no reason. Two seats right front. Yeah, there's two seats in front and three right here. No reason people should be sitting unless, I mean, standing. Unless they really want to stand. So you, you all have to, you all have to sit, stand up now. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, yay. Okay, and then we're not so lonely up here, which is beautiful. And I also just wanted, um, I should have done this at the beginning, give the performers a head up. A heads up, we're going to go Cheryl and Francine and then Iris and then Jess and intermission. And then um, Joy is sick today. She sort of informed me last minute. And as we do in these um, post-COVID times when we're sick or when we think we're contagious, we do not go out out of courtesy for other people. So I want to honor Joy. Um, so she, she was sort of our musician. Her book is uh, The Trails of a Wild Sunflower, which has a QR code, which you can um, uh, listen to her, read her poetry, and it's very good. I highly encourage. She will maybe perform at a future Wolf's Voices, but so we will have uh, Kanika and Tarini after intermission. I think we might actually break before Jess, we'll, for, we'll, we'll see. Uh, on timing. So <laughs> I hope Jess is like, okay, yes, that's what I want. So, um, but just um, so the performers themselves have a little bit of a heads up um, as to what's going on. So can we give another howl up for Cheryl and such a lovely way of opening up, honoring the space and welcome to bring us all in. So <laughs> absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Um, and I am delighted to welcome Francine Cunningham to the stage Ooh. here in the flesh. <laughs> I feel like I feel like I need to, yeah, I don't know if medals or stars, but I, there's an energetic <laughs> one going out there. So um, Francine Cunningham is an Indigenous writer, artist, and educator. She has published an award-winning book of short fiction called God Isn't Here Today and has a book of poetry out called On Me, which you can right there. Um, her first children's book titled What If Bedtime Didn't Exist was just released with Anik Press in 2024. Beautiful, um, whimsical book, highly, really good children's book. Uh, I, I'm a bit of a children's book corner star, so I very much admire yours. Um, she is currently the distinguished writer in residence at the University of Calgary um, and a wonderful uh, Wonderful human being. So please welcome, <laughs> wonderful writer and human being. Please welcome Francine Cunningham to the stage. Um, so I just realized that I was standing there. I lost an earring. So if people see this anywhere, yeah. you can just like message me We're all on Facebook <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and uh, we can arrange for it to come back into my life. But if it doesn't, I'll just turn it into a necklace. <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you so much for having me here. I was pretty bummed I couldn't come last month, so I was very, very happy that I was able, or that um, it was, well, the voices were very accommodating to let me come this month. So thank you. <laughs> uh, all right. And thank you so much for that welcome. Um, as you were talking, I was, the piece that I chose for today is really fitting with what you were talking about. So I felt like this is a great um, fit together and I love when that happens. Um, so yeah, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign up for the walk, um, bring, my, uh, bring my nieces and nephews. Um, all right, so the piece I'm gonna read is uh, an essay actually. So um, uh, my book of poetry was mentioned, I'll just, uh, one here and uh the, the the book of short stories is at the front and i just said i would highlight them because shelf life books was so nice to bring them in to the store so um it's always really cool to support indie book sources we all know uh so yeah so uh anyways i'm going to be reading an essay and i don't think i've actually read this essay out loud before so um 
it was published um, a while ago, uh, and it was shortlisted for the Edna Stabler um, New Quarterly Award for short fiction or for essays, and then it was, um, yeah, I think that's it. But <laughs> I was like, was it in the best Canadian essays? It might have been. Uh, anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so this, uh, this essay is called Half Breed. Um, the smell of burning sage and sweet grass lingers on my skin. My hands fold in prayer, and I send the smoke up to the creator. I send it to my mom, my aunties, my uncles, my grandfather, my great-great-grandparents. I send the smoke that calms my spirit to their place of spirit. I thank them. They are the blood, the memories, the story that moves through me. My words capture the stories of our history. I give them away. That is my role, my job. Although I don't always understand it. The smoke clears space for them, all of the words. The smokes give us a line. The smoke gives us a line to each other. The smoke. It lingers on my skin, folds itself into my hair, tucks itself into my clothing, reminds me to stop, to pray, to make space for them, for stories. They made me forget my creed. My cookum speaks to me as we sit around her table with a plate of bannock, my fresh jam and some tea harvested in the summer between us. There's a lot of laughter when you're speaking Cree. One person says a few words and then another joins in a few words and then, I don't know, we're all just laughing. They call you the crazy people because you're making all kinds of racket. I get most of the Cree back, although I don't know. Maybe I lost more than I know. I don't know about that. She's looking down at her hands rubbing them over each other, stalling at the places where they're knobbed. Her fingers used to be able to sew moccasins into the early hours of the morning, hold a needle between two fingers and string beads. Her hands used to be struck because she spoke words that were deemed inferior. The Indian agent. He came and he took us told my mother she now had a job, took my brother and, told, and me to the store, bought us some new clothes, I got a dress and some shoes, and then the next day we left Saddle Lake. They took away my new dress when I got to the school. I only got to wear it that one day. Then they gave me shoes that didn't fit. White Buffalo. That's what my family joked about over big dinners in my grandparents' trailer, back when we all used to gather for meals. Cousins, aunties, uncles, we all out of the small kitchen, into the deck, into the lawn, plates of food stacked on TV dinner trays, laughing. My cousins and I would all line up to get our photograph taken, and they would all laugh. White buffalo, because of how white my skin was compared to everybody else's. We were always hungry, my cookum says. All of us were always hungry. There was no good food, not like I was used to, battles back in Saddle Lake home. My grandmother and my mother's cooking was altogether different from this school. Some of us girls, we used to line up to set the table and the oldest girl, who was setting out the dishes, she would bring the bread and be pouring the milk into the cups. She would look around to see if the matron was there. And as soon as we were alone, the older girl would run to the double doors and close them. She would grab some bread from her pockets and throw it up in the air. And we would all just try and catch the bread. Some of us would be on the floor looking for the bread that fell. We were just like little dogs looking for this bread trying to make a go of filling our hungry stomachs. She would open the door and run away so we wouldn't get her in trouble. 
When I think of what my granny would make us when we went to stay with her, I think of the towering heaps of bannock, the jars of fresh pickles with their tops popped. I think of frozen berries thawed and put in a sauce of cream. I think of stew. I think of individual mini cereal boxes in front of wrestling on the TV. Mm. I think of fish and chips wrapped in newspaper, of KFC buckets. I think of my granny always making sure that we had enough, pushing food into our hands for the drive home. When I got there, they covered my head in coal oil, the oil that they light the lamps with. They combed my head and there were all these white little worms in it. My cousin had to wash my hair after, but soap wasn't that plentiful. We had to do that every time they brought in a new girl. I guess that's why most of us have problems with our scalps. The words struck me in my face, prairie n-word. They, they were meant to hurt me, and they did. Violence against me, violence against our women, violence against our men, generations of violence, striking us in the face. I never got to speak to my brother the whole length of time we were there. The only time I seen him was when we were walking into the dining room. The boys would be on one side, the girls on the other. I never got to see my mother the whole time I was there. She was working there in the Reverend's house, but they wouldn't let us speak. There was always someone watching. When you looked up, there was always someone looking at you, but not my, my mother and not my brother. I grew up in the city. I spent moments of time on reserves. My mother and father didn't enjoy camping, so I never learned how to be in the bush. I lived with my gran grandparents for a time in Little Buffalo, up in Northern Alberta. I remember berry picking. I remember selling bannock and bee work at powwows, but I remember the city more. I heard Cree spoken by my grandparents as I laid in the dark on sleepovers. I know my mother's dark skin and I know my father's white skin, her brown eyes and his blue eyes. I didn't learn much there. I never got more than great vibes. I didn't, I don't know what we were supposed to learn. You are one of the good ones. This phrase, this compliment that I'm supposed to be grateful for is one that strangers speak to me too often. And when I look them in the eye and ask them what they mean, they stammer back, well, you aren't a drunk and then you have a master's degree. You're working, you're one of the good ones. A lot of boys ran away from school. They got to work outside on the farm and then they ran away most times in the winter and they froze on the road because they had no warm clothes. We lost many. There are a lot of graves up there. You're not really. My friend said this to me. You were only <coughs> Métis. I stood up then. I am Cree and I am Métis. Cree for my mom, Métis for my dad. And I am what I am. Sometimes I feel, feel like people want me to wear my status card around my neck to offer proof of who I am. But what does the status card prove anyways? It's just a hard piece of plastic with my picture and some letters and some numbers. In my, I am my experience. I am my grandparents' memories. I am my parents' stories. I am. I had an infected ear from being beaten. My cousin who was there, Nellie, Nellie Carlson, she would clean my ear because it smelled so bad. None of the matrons, the women who looked after us, would maintain it. If you got caught talking Cree, you got hit in your head more than anything else. So that's where I got my loss of hearing from. When I first learned about blood quantum, about the charts and the amount of blood you needed to be considered native, I was disgusted and I am disgusted because 
what are they saying in my half breed or in my stories, in my memory? My, my brother and I didn't understand English. My grandpa and grandma didn't understand English. It was only my mother because of her time at the residential school who understood when the Indian agent came and told her that she had to come work there and that we had to come too. It was only the next day when he came back driving up in his big car that it sunk into my grandparents and they started crying and we were all crying because we had to leave and they didn't want to let us go. So smoke. It lingers on my skin. My prayers, they linger in the breeze. Our stories, they linger in my mind. And now, yours. That was very powerful, Francine. Thank you. Um, and neat to hear uh, a different type of writing from you, a, a different piece. So thank you. Let's howl one more time. <laughs> Okay, so next up we have Iris Hill. Yes. Um, Iris Hill is a transgender author from Calgary, Alberta, um, whose stories use monsters to explore the human condition. And she's published in the Prairie Witch Anthology, which we do apparently have here. I'm not sure if they found it, they were looking for copies of it, but it's a, a fabulous story in the book and a fabulous book. I highly recommend getting it. So please welcome Iris Hill. How do you adjust this thing? I'm, I'm vertically challenged in the other direction. Oh, there we are. Okay. Okay. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd also like to quickly mention I'm also going to be published in the forthcoming Prairie Devil, also from Prairie Soul Trips, coming this October. Um, yeah. Um, before I start reading this little thing, uh, I want to start by thanking Adrienne and the Wolf's Voices team uh, for inviting me to be part of this event. Um, Despite being a wordsmith, supposedly, um, I can't seem to find the words to express how honored I am to be included in this amazing group of writers, artists, and women. I know that as a trans feminine person, my relationship with womanhood isn't exactly standard issue, but um, is there such a thing, really? <laughs> um, Regardless, I still can't rightly say just how much it means to me to uh, to have the chance to share this stage and this story with all of you tonight. Most of the stories I write intertwine my personal experiences with mythology and folklore. And one of my favorite uh, myths is an Eastern European creature called the Rusalka. She's the spirit of a drowned woman that both helps and haunts her community, granting bounty to those who honor her and death to those who intrude upon her rest. This relationship between a wronged woman and the community that sees her as both a provider and a monster compels me more than pretty much any other folk tale. And I only hope that the story I'm about to tell can honor hers. So this is a story I wrote just for this event. You're Woo! welcome. <laughs> I wake in the grave you left me in. Stretching my cold limbs, I let out a yawn, murky water filling my lungs as I rise from the riverbed. I remember when I first rose like this, how our neighbors cried out 
at the thing you made of me. How their faces turned pale, though never as pale as my own. I remember them saying how tragic it was that such a fate should befall me, or else how horrible that I should linger as a grim reminder of what might befall their daughters. And I remember how you, the one who befell me, said nothing at all. But there is no one to gawk now as I pull myself onto the riverbank. Enough time has passed and their horror has dulled to unease. I am only another dead thing, just as you made me. As uneasy as I make them, our neighbors still think of me. I find the evidence on the stones as I crawl to the water's edge. There are clothes here and flower bouquets and art, and even the foods I love before you filled my heart with water. Most of these gifts are petitions, given in the hopes I will reciprocate in my way. Others are tokens of mourning <clears throat> from those who remember what happened to me. A few are even apologies, but not a single one is from you. The point where the soil turns to mud our neighbors must think that if they so much as get their feet wet, pull them into the river, forcing them to join me. They're wrong, of course. I'm not as cruel as you. My bloodless feet carry me to the water's edge, and I accept our neighbors' gifts. I cannot appreciate them as I did once, not since you laid me in the riverbed but they still make me feel something. Perhaps I feel powerful knowing, knowing that even now our neighbors ask for my mercy. Perhaps I'm grateful that I'm in their thoughts at all, but mostly I just feel a little more alive and that is enough. When you laid me in the river, you never thought I would find power there. But eventually, our neighbors and I noticed the life around my deathbed. How tall the trees grew, how vibrant the flowers bloomed. Our neighbors wondered if I could give them some of that richness. And though you laid me in the river, I am not bound by its borders. I walk beyond the woods to the place we once called home. And all the while, the river follows me like a bridal train. Its waters soak the dry soil in my wake. By next month, it will be lush with whatever our neighbors desire. While I walk between their homes, I see them watching me from their windows. Even now, as I fill my end of their bargain, they keep their distance. They close their curtains to me and they usher their children away as if I would make them like me if they drew too close. They do not know that I am only what you made of me, that half of them would be as I am if you were only a little less discreet. Their fear stings me, but you've put me through worse. I leave them in their hiding places as the water pulls me back to the riverbed. This is my end of the bargain and I've fulfilled it time and time again. But this time, something is different. This time, I find you waiting for me by the river. If my heart still beat, it would skip at the sight of you. You give me one of your awful smiles, full of surety instead of kindness. You say how beautiful I am, how fair my skin, how rich my hair. Of course you heap praises on my corpsehood. That is what you made of me, after all. 
You also say how proud you are that I've forgiven our neighbors, how nice it is that I answered their petitions in spite of everything. Not in spite of you, of course. You made me what I am, but that is a boon, you say. Where would I be without you? Then you extend your hand, and I finally see why you have come. You made me what I am. Don't I owe you? You gave me this power as a gift. Isn't it time for me to give back? I reflect your smile. You're right, I admit. You did make me what I am. Our feet splash through the mud as I take your hands and lead you to my bed. The water trails after us like a bridal gown. The world around us is vibrant and alive. I wrap my cold arms around you. The water wraps around us both, and your lips part in hunger as they draw close to mine. Your eyes close as we kiss, and I grasp your hair to pull you deeper in. It is only when I pull your head under the water that you realize that Although I am what you made me, I am not what you wanted to make. You wished to make me a thing, lovely object, only then though you laid me in the riverbed and my corpse, thinking dead meant docile, meant desirable. You never meant for me to find power in the water. You never meant for me to rise. You have given me nothing, but you took everything from me. So I owe you nothing. And now it is my turn to take. Tearing the breath from your lungs, I savor the taste of the life you stole from me. It satisfies more than any gift. And when at last I have taken what I want, I lay you beside me in the riverbed. It is no more or less than you deserve. Thank you. powerful and enthralling and all the things. So let's give one more howl for Iris Hill. <laughs> and super honored that you wrote a story just for us. Maybe maybe we'll see her story published somewhere else soon. It's really, really fabulous. I think we're going to take a 10 minute break. Um, it's just after eight. Um, I do have wine. I have better wine than lots of wine, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So um, there is, there is chocolates and wine and coffee and tea and candy uh, by donation. Donations go back into the event to make better events, such as um, better wine. But, but, <laughs> but you know, yeah. they, they, they fuel the, the event and the artists wherever uh, we most need that. So um, if you have it, please donate generously. And if not, please help yourself. There's It's by donation. There's no requirement. So uh, let's all congregate and uh, come back in about 10 minutes. We have three more performers, the one who just arrived. So let's howl for everyone who performed so far. Oh! Go buy lots of books. Give a howl out for Shala. Shella? <laughs> I never wix my words up, I swear. Um, let's howl out for shelf life, please. Okay, we'll see you in 10. I'm much better at Oh, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah, ye
Yeah, was like, okay, okay. I was like, I because of time um, and because Cheryl opened the space so lovely I didn't really feel like it was necessary so there you go um, but I am going to read a poem in honor of a friend of mine who recently passed away um, and uh, yeah the circumstances were not super happy um, and she was um, a member of the poetry community her name is Selena Edith Clary and um, the last time I saw her, she read at the open mic at the uh, little pop-up we did for Wolf's Voices at the People's Poetry Festival last uh, spring. And uh, we just had a beautiful memorial service to honor her on Sunday, where I read some poetry that really I did feel honor her and her struggles. Um, but it's quite dark. And I, I more just wanted to honor her voice because she spoke at the open mic at PPF and came up to me afterwards and told me how grateful she was that she had a chance to speak. And I wish I had a picture of that, of her on the open mic, but I do not. Um, and I thought she had featured at Wolf's Voices, but I think she just came and did a couple of our open mics because we used to have an open mic. So this is Selena Edith Clary's feature in spirit. And I'm going to read her poem uh, from Hughes Meadows, which is published on the YYC Pop website, uh, which was put up by Sherry D. Wilson, um, who's always been a great supporter of Wolf's Voices uh, when she was Poet Laureate of Calgary. So it's called uh, From Hughes Meadows. If I can't, the universe will, is what your great uncle says. I believe in God's unfailing love is a thing I repeat, but I know you're agnostic this week. Golden boy of our five-year plan, as a fetus evicted from an emerald apartment, adults only, and the black mold costs extra. We begin the name story everyone can play from an inhospitable place, the chariot glides, through the sage, our little warrior. Despite the economics of fear, there are adventures and ice cream and snake neck turtles are your friends. In the rooms, the women come and go, Instagramming like Michelangelo's, don't get sucked in. We know that heart rhymes with art and moon rhymes with June. Let's not worry about sweatshops tonight. Well, the left hand looks for work and the right hand holds the pen. Here's the poem for infinity, mon amour. So, Selena, we honor you. Please howl with me. Oh. Oh. Thank you. 
Um, so next up, I would like to welcome Jess M M Martin Sheardown to the stage. I'm very excited. Um, and she dyed her hair like multicolor rainbow, and I feel like you did it just for wolf's voices. Anyways, I'm very excited. It was my favorite color before, like bright flush and purple, and now it's like all of my favorite, it's all the colors. It's uh, absolutely beautiful. So Jess Martin Sheardown is a small town northern Ontarian transplant who now calls Calgary home. An obsessive consumer and creator of the arts, her chosen forms range from theater to fiber art to writing. She has been an open mic contributor at People's Poetry Festival and the Calgary Poetry Slam, a contributor to the Indie YYC Speak Up series and Inspire series, and a feature poet at the Writers Guild of Alberta's Poetry Parlor. Her work centers on the divide and overlap of the personal and political, centering her own lived experiences in a body that is sometimes faulty, as I feel all her bodies can be. So um, please give a howl for Jess Martin Sheardown. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Oh, see, now I'm like, Iris is talking about needing a color, and I'm like, is this, uh, is this thing on? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, we're good. Um, oh, I'm good. I think we're good, Adrian. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the best intros and just take such good care of me. Um, I would like to just first say thank you. Okay, so full disclosure, I've only been doing spoken word out loud in front of people for uh, a year this month. Uh, the, first, <laughs> right? the first one I ever did was actually at Wolf's Voices pop up at the People's Poetry Festival. <laughs> so it's apropos that this is Poetry Month and that we've come full circle here and that you're all having to listen to me. Thank you for taking a break beforehand and taking some wine in. I'm much more palatable after that. Um, I'm going to read a few pieces uh, today, a little bit of some, some rage, some not so much, um, and I'll give a little bit of an intro before those. Uh, but yeah, thank you, Wolf's Voices, for having me. Thanks, Shelf Life. Thanks to everybody who's come so far already today and who will be after me. Um, you're all amazing, and I'm honored to be here. So uh, without further ado. I'm always so awkward before I start reading. I'm like, nah, 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 nah. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> this one, it is National Poetry Month this month, but last month was Women's History Month, and I had a lot of thoughts. So this one is called Women's History Month. It's Women's History Month. It's Women's History Month, and I am reflecting on the history of my mothers and foremothers, on the history that we're told, on the intersection of history and her story, on resilience and remembering, on how history is the tale of the victors. And I am reflecting on our working life while corporations everywhere are paying lip service to equality, throwing up pretty pink empowerment seminars over their lunch hours while simultaneously paying their women 9.2% less and putting in glass ceilings that keep women away from seats at tables, out of boardrooms, absent from decision making. After all, women comprise 51% of the population, but only 20% of boards of directors. It's Women's History Month. And I am reflecting on athletics. Well, college basketball, March Madness, sweeps sports channels, but everywhere on social media are men trying to, ter de trying to determine what they'll do when there are days off in the schedule or space between games, completely omitting the fact that the women are competitive too. And discussions about the GOAT are not considering the achievements of women, identifying them only as the spouse of another famous person instead of owning fame in their own right. It's Women's History Month. And I am reflecting on our right to privacy while Instagram is awash in conspiracy theories and harassment, pressuring a princess to the point that she feels she must record a statement disclosing her personal health diagnosis because aren't we entitled to know where she is and what she's been doing? And dear God, the palace has to stop the rumors of a divorce. It's Women's History Month. And I'm reflecting on my body while TikTok is awash in pink and the divine feminine and also horrifying tales of how women have received less pain management than men because the cervix 
actually does have nerve endings, and if men had to have a speculum anywhere near their body, they'd be fucking sedated. <laughs> it's Women's History Month. And I'm reflecting on my education while places of higher education are tweeting out International Women's Day greetings, even as their female students are facing greater risk just by being there, scanning and rescanning every room that they enter, making sure their backs are never to the door, and mapping out an escape route because any moment could be a 1989 repeat of a coal polytechnique or a 2023 University of Waterloo, or having to dodge cat calls or a moving projectile when they're just trying to learn. It is education at a premium, subordination at a minimum, but why aren't women higher achievers? It's Women's History Month, and I'm reflecting on decisions while governments are sharing posts about all their important women, even as our neighbors to the south have at least 13 states with pending bills that consider embryos people canceling IVF and Roe v. Wade and taking away a federally protected right for women to be able to choose all while we pat ourselves on the back in Canada about how progressive we are, but that ideology just keeps creeping northward. It's Women's History Month, and I am reflecting on dangers while the media drags assault survivors through a smear campaign, telling women how not to be assaulted instead of teaching men how not to assault, oh, teaching us how to wield keys like Wolverine on the slow walk to your car, about covered drinks and tossed ones, stranger danger and whispered warnings, Text when you're home safe and code words on a first blind date. And don't you dare forget to turn on the location in an Uber if you're by yourself. It's Women's History Month. And I'm reflecting on the voices that are missing, on the exhaustion that comes with platitudes instead of active change, and all the work that women have had to put in to never, ever break even. It's Women's History Month. And isn't it time that we learn from it to keep history from repeating itself? Whoa. Whoa. We had a lot of rage. <laughs> um, sweet, thank you. I should have warned you. Everybody else was so polite and had no swears in the first half, and I'm like dropping a lot of f bombs on here. So consider that's a good thing you had wine. <laughs> here we go. Um, so a couple more. Um, this one, this one, uh, Adrian mentioned in her lovely intro to me. Um, that I also do fiber art. So during the pandemic, when I found myself with a lot of time and hands that needed to be kept busy, I picked up crochet. Um, and uh, you can <laughs> say, you can later ask my husband what's happened with my yarn collection and how it's taken over our house. But in the meantime, um, so one of the things I really found is a connection to the people who crochet with me and what that kind of means. And so I wrote this little, this little ditty called Stitch. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm so awkward in here. <laughs> <clears throat> Insert hook, yarn over, pull through. The instructions for getting through any tough life project. Insert hook. I stitch with the love of my grandmothers, weaving their life and their experience in every thread, the knots and circles tightening around our shared history. Yarn over with stick and string, looping and leading through every double crochet, transforming life's tension into yarn tension to help complete both projects. Pull through. I stitch with a room full of like-minded folks, a predominantly female and female-identified driven space, making political and personal change in a crafting circle over something so long dismissed as women's work. Insert hook. I stitch over coffee and conversation, community building and tea, both the drinkable and the gossip varieties, searching for answers to the world's problems on the end of each of our hooks. Yarn over. I stitch emphatically to quell my rage, move both hands faster, the fabric of this next item growing rapidly, a tactile way for me to make progress in a world that is hell-bent on undoing any progress so far made. Pull through. I stitch to find my people, my ancestors, and current connections alike, for there is magic here in conversations, connections, and women helping women. Insert hook. I stitch to create community, to connect with those who find joy and rage and resistance too, and the long ago art, not just craft, vanished to the dark corners of domestic life. Yarn over. I stitch with the love of my people, the shared knowledge of hundreds of years working with these two simple instruments, 
creating warmth with yarn and with words to protect from the outside world's frosty reception. Pull through. I stitch because I need to, because they need to, because we need to, and we need each other. And this safe space that we've cultivated to support one another. Insert hook, yarn over, pull through, pull through, pull through. Yeah, okay. It's a good thing someone's got an eye on the time. Well. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. <laughs> also have time blindness from ADHD, so it's a good thing somebody's got me. Um, all right. Um, this one, speaking of my hair and the jacket I have on, I think this is an appropriate one to end on. Um, so a little bit, full disclosure, this one was written as a response to a human who came up to me on the street while I was wearing hot pink leggings and told me I was super brave for wearing them. <laughs> as, <laughs> she told me she loved them and then followed that up by telling me I was brave for wearing them. And as a fat woman, you kind of get what that was going for. And so I, uh, I I went home and had a moment and from there came this piece. And so <laughs> <laughs> I present Dress for Success. <laughs> It took until I was in my 30s to really recognize that one of the most political things that I will ever do in this life is get dressed. My closet is a dopamine collection full of bright colors and endless pattern, tight dresses and shapeless shirts, pieces I've picked to dress myself because I love them, not because I am told to wear them, not because I am brave for wearing them. You see, my garments are a group of tiny revolutions, each one a fuck you to the rules I've been fed as a fat woman, the stock in your guts and the nothing too tights and the make sure you wear black because it's so flattering. I don't owe anybody flattering. I don't owe anybody flattering. And when I finally put on the thing that I love, the thing that sticks up a middle finger to all the rules, listen to how it rattles. The audible discomfort of others, those that are pissed. Not so much at me, mind you, but at the social contract who told them that they were morally good because they were small. So they grasped at straws using the bless your heart attitude to undercut my joy with her frames of, oh, she's just too much or what a big personality. When really what they mean is that my body is too much. It does not conform, it takes up space, it is loud and unapologetic. And my refusal to try and shrink, to blend into the background both in size and in dress challenges that social contract lie. My love of spandex, of green leather jackets, of rainbow hair, and of large pink glasses, each fashion choice a challenge to the lies they've been fed, that happiness lies in just being a little bit lighter, eating a little bit less. After all, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels, right? And you'll finally reach the pinnacle once you hit your goal weight. Fuck that. <laughs> there is no such thing as a goal. Wait, you see, I have goals to become more, not less. I don't owe anybody their rules and regulations, their policing and their politics. I'm beholden only to myself, to my wants, my wishes, to the little pieces of my soul that are witnessed on my hangers. And I am not taking a trip down dress for your body, I'm not working on highlighting my assets. I'm not looking at the end of the line because weight is not a journey. And my clothing choices are not meant to be mile markers, visual depictions of corporality decreasing because that's supposed to be the way. Instead, I will choose to wear them, to love them, without any regard for trying to shrink with the goal of only continuing to grow. Even when the world says that to become more, you need to become less, to be less, to lose. Not a chance. I fought tooth and nail to add to my clothing collection, and at this point in my life, frankly, I do not need to experience any more loss. Thank you. Um, leather jackets for us. You read two of my favorite poems tonight, and then, like, that fabulous new first one is, yeah, also almost made me cry. New so, shit. new shit. New Let's shit. howl up for just <laughs> Martin Sheardown. Oh! Yeah, that was absolutely fabulous. Okay. 
So we have two more performers tonight. I am super excited um, to welcome Trini Fernando to the stage. Um, and let me read to you about Trini, um, who I first met in a class. And, and so I got to experience her writing process. She's a fabulous writer. And uh, I'm really excited to see where you go uh, next. <laughs> So Tirini Fernando is a writer and publisher's representative who recently completed her master's in English at the University of Calgary with a creative thesis that explores the biotext, desire, and existential anxieties. Her writing can be found online at CBC News. And I do have to say that you will hear her read and you will hear her write. And some of Tirini's most brilliant poetic plays happen visually on the page. So I also encourage you to seek out her publications and read her writing. Please welcome Tarini Fernando to the stage. Okay, I'm going to have to read. This is like pretty locked in place. Yeah, okay. So the thing about this mic, I should have mentioned this earlier. Is this a surround sound mic? Oh. So you don't actually necessarily have to. I don't have to be that close. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Okay. I should have put it. You don't see me? I'm so yeah. tiny. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, Hello. 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 Yeah, it's good. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, just so excited uh, to be here. Thank you so much, Adrian. Uh, this feels very full circle because I, I some of these poems started uh, in the poetry class <laughs> that we did together. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm very grateful to just be able to share the mic with so many amazing, wonderful artists and writers. Um, so thank you again uh, for inviting me, and I'm so excited to to read some stuff. Um, I'm only gonna read uh, a couple short little poems for you guys. Um, the first one is, I, I guess I'm struggling to choose uh, poems that kind of fit with this broad but wonderful theme <laughs> of the feminine and femininity. Um, so I kind of just chose two poems that I think, uh, to me, kind of just feel personal. And I feel like they reflect on just what it's like, I think, both for me and maybe for other people, what it's like to just be a young Gen Z, ugh, I know, <laughs> hetero-ish woman today. <laughs> in our world, uh, which is like always a super <laughs> chill experience. Um, yeah, um, this one's a, a prose poem, I guess is what I'm calling it. Um, and I, I wrote it because I, I'd like to submit it to a specific journal. Have a very best folks heard of Three Elements, the it's like an online review. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. You've probably heard of the concept. But essentially, uh, the magazine it releases like three words every, I think it's like four times a year. Um, and the idea is that everybody who submits their, their writing and their artwork uh, to the magazine has to include those three words in their piece. Um, I just love the stuff that they publish. So I, I wrote something that is, is for this quarter. Um, I'm not going to say what the three words are, so you can guess after. Um, and I'm not going to give you any more context because I think that'll be fun for you and more embarrassing for me. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <clears throat> flame. Okay. <clears throat> it's gonna be hard because fans in the room. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. He has a beard. A clean cut, not too long, fat oval on his white chin. He's wearing an expensive looking suit in pick two and has a goddamn smile that makes me smile. And of course we matched. We're both looking for short term, open to long, and I think, what if it could be the latter? <laughs> <laughs> he says, I got a cat, because my bio says extra points if you have a cat. <laughs> I say, oh, what's the kitty's name? <laughs> he says, Bartleby, because the cat's an antagonistic piece of shit. <laughs> and I say, LOL, iconic. But in my head, I think, he knows literature. <laughs> And that's so rare, so what if? He asks about me, and I ask about him, and we learn really interesting information about each other. 
And I imagine this going for coffee on 17th, maybe to analog or philosophy, and he's wearing a pea coat. And I see him walk down the street with his almond milk skin and black cat hair in the middle of a crowd. And I smile and he smiles at sexy fucking smile. <laughs> And we get some savory strudel of the vaguely Eastern European bakery and make small talk with the cashier lady. And I don't feel jealous at all when you jokingly flirt with her because I feel so secure in our relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and we walk outside holding hands and he feeds me a bite of the strudel. And we spend the next hour laughing as we watch magpies attack children in the park. <laughs> And I continuously pick pieces of pastry out of his beautiful beard. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> he asks me where I'm from, and I say, Prince Edward Island. And I ask him, and he's of Anchorage. And I say, oh, an American. <laughs> and he says, LOL, no, I, I was only born there. I grew up in Kelowna. <laughs> and I get anxious because I think I hit a sore spot because there were no explains in that last message. <laughs> And what if he hates me because I accuse him of being an American? <laughs> what if he has terrible, mem terrible memories of Anchorage because he had an abusive father? <laughs> I imagine us strapping into a plane, and I hold this strong, hairy hand, and I say, just breathe, it's going to be okay. Because we're going to Anchorage to see his dying father, because even though the man abused him, he's still his father, and he has to say goodbye. And maybe even confront him about his drunkenness. And when we land in Alaska, I joke and we say, finally, back in America, the homeland. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughs because by then we have an understanding of each other's humor and no one to stop pushing on each other's vulnerabilities. <laughs> <laughs> I say in the combo, ha ha. <laughs> I was actually born outside of Canada too. And he's like, yeah, where? And I say, Sri Lanka. And he says, oh, it's very exciting. <laughs> and I don't know what to say to that. So I say, LOL, ye. <laughs> be exciting. And then we don't message each other for a couple of days. <laughs> and I imagine his father dying alone. <laughs> After we fly back home, because we can only bear one conversation with the man who ruined his chapter. <laughs> And on the day of our wedding, I look at myself in the mirror and I think, oh my goodness, this must be so difficult with neither of his parents here because his mother also struggled with addiction. So to be home to the <laughs> and I run out of my room, dragging my wedding dress on the red soil because for some reason I went back to PEI to get married. <laughs> and I asked the priest, my parents and sister had a little Catholic wedding, <laughs> where my fiance went. And the priest points into the ocean. And I say, oh God. And I run toward my future husband while my dress gets stained higher and higher with red dirt. And I finally catch up to him just as he's about to drown himself in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And I say, David, you're not your father. <laughs> and he falls to his knees into the ocean. And I embrace him. <laughs> he messages on Tinder on Sunday. And the pink flame in my heart lights up. So I wait for a few hours before clicking the notification. Because what if he asked me to go out for coffee at Analog or Philosophy? And it all begins. And so I click it. And he's like, so do you work out? <laughs> Thank you. about uh, trauma and traumatic experiences in a direct way, um, even if it can be hard or difficult or impossible to articulate exactly what you're going through. Um, and I feel I just I saw Sarah Ahmed as I was walking up, and I was just reminded of everything that I was reading at that time. And I was reading a lot of affect theory um, and a lot of Sarah Ahmed and Audre Lorde talking about pleasure um, and kind of how the 
the erotic comes from like a feminine place, which is within all of us, um, and how kind of to work towards better worlds and demand better worlds, we have to acknowledge the pain and the injustice that we live in currently. Um, so yeah, I, I thought a lot about in my thesis about how uh, pleasures and pain are, are very interconnected um, and trauma and healing are very interconnected. Um, so yeah, uh, this is an attempt to just talk about trauma. There's no explicit details or descriptions just so you folks know. Um, but yeah, it's an attempt to look at trauma and how it kind of lives in our bodies. Um, and it is a bit of a visually experimental poem. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> little description, Adrian, I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see if it works out loud. Um, the poem is called The Distraction. <clears throat> the Distraction. Came crawling through your lacrimal caracol last Thursday night when he caressed your leg while you two lay sideways rewatching succession. Annoyed at the, for blurring your vision, interrupting each sober hookup, you thought, what a fucking turn off. When you were at Safeway scoffing at the price of a two liter carton of milk, for no obvious reason that popped out of your uvula, choked your next sentence, flooded your eyes, confused your roommate who looked at you with worry and said, it's okay, I'll get the milk this time. Remember when it ripped a hole through your abdomen the morning of a job interview? Oh, you were really mad at the, then. You cursed it, wanted to wring its neck, bash its face in with a meat tenderizer. But despite your upset stomach, you put on a smile during the Zoom call and said, I'm doing really great, thanks, Jerry, how are you? The, that tenacious D dragged the folds of your brain apart yesterday when you sat down to write your thesis. Every line punched out revolved around it, digging a hole from your amygdala the memory wormed its way through your nasal cavity and shot outward into the air, where you had to see the blurred image, the outline of this analid, and remember. Thank you. Be an anchorage. Anchorage, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The other two were wedding dress. This the last one was very hard. Crowd. Oh. Hey. Oh. was amazing. I curate this show and then I am always invariably humbled by what is presented and tonight is no exception. It has been phenomenal and I am super excited for our final reader of the evening um, who is uh, Kamika Bianca Gara Walker um, of Jamaican and Chilean heritage is a Calgarian multidisciplinary visionary curating as a visual artist, poet, model, actress, community organizer, public speaker, and excelling producer and writer. Um, she has a website, kamika.ca, and you can also look her up, Kamika Bianca, Gara Walker, and the Walker Foundation. So um, a truly, um, multidisciplinary woman uh, of much admi admiration. Please welcome Mika to the stage. shaky so I'm going to take this moment to ground us 
and I want you to ground with me because I think that if I feel your energy, then I'll be comfortable. Um, before I start, my poems are coming from a place of, of confidence, which is a privilege. Um, we're not always confident, but for me, confidence stems from weakness. When I'm scared and I'm weak and I'm nervous, that's when I step up and that's when confidence comes in. So I wanna take a second to recognize that there are many women who have passed away on this land, indigenous, black, people of color. There are women who have chosen to identify as a woman and not seen as that, which is not fair. Um, and there are women that don't have a chance to just be themselves. So when I step into this confidence, I want us to recognize that it is a privilege and that we want to think about those women in, in our daily lives. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes with me and think about everything that you're grateful for. I'm grateful to be here with you. I'm grateful for Adrian. I'm grateful for Shelf Life Books. I'm grateful for all the artists that have come before me. And I'm grateful for you again. And I ask you to breathe in all the positivity and breathe out all the negativity. I felt that. Thank you. This first poem is called, If Not Us, Then Who? <laughs> I might be alone, cause I'm the one. He knows I do right and he knows that I get it done. You don't know my name, but you know my face. I'm that woman walking with grace. There's lace on my legs and a cross on my heart. Jesus is the king. Read the Bible if you don't know the rest. The cross on my chest, this is a test that I plan to pass. With zeros on the check, and hero in my resume. This is our year, no matter what you say. If not us, then who? Who's breaking barriers and generational curses? Who's changing the system with a purpose? Who's walking with me? I'll go fast alone, but farther if you come with me. This next one I wrote specifically for tonight. Um, I'm happy that I had this inspiration and it's just about being a woman. And I'm gonna play a track to accompany it. Um, I really like music, I like jazz, I like ambiance. I like to fill that space. So join me in listening to um, Berlioz. He's a jazz artist. He's amazing. I've been following him since he had about two followers. Now he's going across the world. And I, I write a lot to him, so I want to share that with you today. Technology. I got Okay, we're going somewhere. We got this. We got this. <laughs>
enjoy the sound. Feel it. Let it be there with you. Being a woman. <laughs> Being a woman. Being a woman is playing with my hair. Cut, twirl, snip, burn, sparkly clip here and there. Being a woman is lining my lips 20 times in one night. So every time that you glance over, you look just a little longer each time. Being a woman is making you think twice. Think twice about approaching me. Are you a man of God who's compassionate and filled with integrity? Or are you dull and boring? Are you someone I would regret waking up to in the morning? If you think that's harsh, <laughs> give me a break. You try bleeding for seven days straight. You try being a maker of life. You try smiling when things ain't right. You try working for a dollar less than a man. You try being a beautiful being treated like a commodity or brand. You try being a woman and see how long you can last. Being a woman is the greatest gift I've ever had. Being a woman is a gift from God. It's painful, rough, and tough, but we can handle it all. Oh, you have a question? What does lining my lips have to do with a man? Well, here, okay, let me explain it then. Picture this. You're on a walk, intending to clear your mind. Life is pushing and pulling you, but you're walking down this path that's just slowing down time. To your left is the horizon where the sun is heavy and the air is light. But as you glance to your right, something catches your sight. You look away, but your neck snaps back as curiosity and desire run hot through your veins, telling your brain, if you look away again, by the time you look back, it will be gone. It's irreplaceable and you'll never find another one. You pluck, pick, and take it into your hands, analyzing its soft horns and delicate petals with intricate hues of amaranth and ginger lime. You admire the flower and you know that it's divine. We are designed as the most beautiful flowers that require tender care, respect, nurturing, and watering of our seeds. But what grows from us affects the world. Do you see? Being a woman is powerful. I think of names like Maya Angelou, Cheryl Fogo, Heather Campo, Linda Congetanen, Pamela Guerra. These are women I look up to in my era. So what kind of woman can I be? I can love and pay attention to the little girl inside of me, the one that laughs and cries, the one who guided me each and every time, the one who first wrote the goals down, the one who dreamed with no bounds. Being a woman is fulfilling my dreams for the benefit of myself and the young women around me. I aspire to inspire, that is my desire, leaving a legacy of encouraging others to always go higher. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it and bless all of you. Jazz was well with the wind. Yes. <laughs> the ambiance and the, the, set, the, the little bit of theater you created for us all there. That was fabulous. Um, yeah, what a fabulous night. Thank you all. The audience is as much a part of Wolf Voices as the performers. The performers were phenomenal. We had a variety of voices, which is always the point. Um, to have many, many perspectives, even perspectives I don't agree with, but all honoring the feminine, however you define it, as we all have that within ourselves. So thank you all. You did a phenomenal job. Thank you to Shelf Life. Let's howl up for Shelf Life and Emma and Ben. You did an awesome job for supporting us. And howl up for the Alexander Writer Center, who is supporting us in multiple ways financially, um, help with the poster, etc.
occasional moral support, which is really nice. Um, and let's howl out for all the wolf voices people of the past, the legacy that we have. We have a few in the crowd. We have A.M. and um, we have Verena Abbott and um, we have Skylar Kay and a few other people, Logan Pollan, who have featured at Wolf's Voices in the past as well. So let's howl out for, for our whole community. <laughs> yeah. And um, the next Wolf Voices will be at the Alcove Center for the Arts on September 18th. We are very excited to be partnering with the Alcove Center for the Arts, which was founded by um, Bethel Applewalk, who's also a Wolf's Voices alumni, and I admire in, indubitably, Im immensely, the work that she has done in community to build community. And then we will be back here in the winter, either in November or February, I'm not quite sure yet, um, back at Shelf Life again to howl where we have howled so many times before. Um, but we're just sort of expanding out a little bit and trying a few different things um, to reach different communities because Wolf's Voices has always been about bridging uh, experienced artists with uh, really well-known artists, published artists with not published artists, um, BIPOC artists, LGBTQ plus artists, etc. Um, all bodies, all ages. So um, yeah, thank you all for being here. And uh, please join us if you want at the Ship and Anchor Pub. I'm famished. Um, <laughs> I did not have supper. I had a late snack. So, um, and they have a completely gluten wheat free section of deep fryer, which is amazing <laughs> when you can't eat wheat anymore. Um, yeah, so please fold your chair up, buy a book, join us at the Ship and Anchor, um, post your pictures, tag us at Wolf's Voices, W O O L F S, uh, uh, Voices, and we will repost your picture. Thanks for coming. So, have a great day. Try to do a, a group shot. Francine had to go on because the cold, dark roads and super windy days. But we can do a group shot with the rest of us. I think if someone's willing to take a picture, maybe um, that would be amazing. Four, maybe. Yeah. So Bianca, can you be part of the picture? You said you're new crone, and I was like, hell yeah. You're <laughs> 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 <laughs>